So you may think, uh, what is this guy doing here? Um, competition law and blockchain, is that probably a bit premature given that the technology is a, a pretty young one and I think, John, that's probably your thought because you only gave me five minutes and you think I could cover um, <laughs> this. So I, I don't agree with that because if you think back um, and look back probably 10, 15 years, no one would have ever thought that an internet surgeon, a search engine would be the most prominent uh, target of a competition law investigation. And now there we are. So this year, a multi-billion fine uh, in that area. So antitrust regulators are actually very interested globally in um, disruptive technology and new technology. It's uh, something they, they are bored by the old cases, all these conspiracies, and, and this is something they first don't understand. They want to interact with you guys and uh, learn what anti-competitive ideas you may have. So um, I will cover three potential ideas. I'm not saying that they're all out there already, um, but uh, there are three topics which I think we can spend these five minutes on. First one is information exchange, second one is access to blockchain, and the third most fancy one is um, paid prioritization. So, very briefly on the first one, that's probably the most obvious one if you think from the antitrust or competition law perspective. Information exchange is something um, that many cartels um, deal with. And what is interesting in relation to blockchain technology, by definition, the information in the blockchain is accessible to everyone. That's part of the uh, DNA uh, of a blockchain that you have a copy of that and you can access that. That's in itself not a problem, but obviously if that information is compet uh, competitively um, significant information like pricing, it becomes more interesting from the antitrust perspective. Again, the mere exchange or uh, disclosure of price is not a problem. You know, for instance, uh, petrol stations do that and there is no pricing problem with their way of setting um, the gas prices. But um, if you combine that uh, feature of um, openness of pricing with algorithms um, which could make use of these uh, information, you're coming to a situation that at least antitrust regulators might think this makes it easier for you to facilitate collusion and enter into anti-competitive agreements. Again, this sounds very far away, but as you can see uh, from the quote uh, of EU Competition Commissioner Vestaya, the Commission is very much thinking in that direction and she is giving and her staff is giving regular talks about um, companies who should, should not hide behind a computer program as uh, she calls it and basically asking market players to program their software and programs in a way that they prevent collusion in the first place. So I think as regards information exchange within blockchain it is the, the takeaway for the legal guys to talk to um, those software engineers to actually understand what type of information goes in there to um, understand what the system may bring for problems in this field. The second aspect, as I said, is about access. And uh, those of you who deal regularly with blockchain uh, know that there are different types of blockchains, open blockchains and closed ones and semi-types. So this is a problem more for the closed or permission-based blockchains or for consortium blockchains, which you may see in the banking area where several banks come together and, and set up um, a blockchain. That is not per se, again, a problem. Um, there is no antitrust uh, principle saying everyone, uh, like the, the hippie theory, must have access to this and this is all great. No, of course you can have uh, closed blockchains. The problem, um, emerges if there are participants who want to uh, access such a um, closed system and the others, the members or the gatekeeper, whoever is assigned with that task, say no. And um, in that situation, uh, you could think about is there actually a real need for access to the system? So only in this case there is an antitrust problem. But if such a closed blockchain, say for instance in payment, really covers a large part of the market, that is something that antitrust authorities will consider. And if you're then in such a situation, you need to think about, is there an objective justification for us to close that system? I think um, Simon mentioned this um, model of, uh, example of new business models uh, regarding banks and IoT. So this could be one example where you bring together industry players in a closed shop and say, well, there are some others actually we would not like to disrupt our business model. 
And it's not, again, a theory which I've developed. You can already see that regulators like ESMA in that field view it as a potential problem in a report published this year. Last one, I'm uh, sorry that I need five and a half minutes um, to close that one off, paid prioritization. What I mean with that is essentially if I pay more to get my transaction cleared in a network, is that a problem? I don't know, but competition law regulators might uh, view it as a problem. And it is actually a real life example. If you look at Bitcoin these days, depending on how much you invest in a transaction, how many Satoshi per byte you pay, you either get your transaction cleared immediately or you wait quite a long time, if probably forever. And uh, that could be to the detriment of certain players in the market, smaller players, consumers, SMEs. Um, and that way, uh, antitrust regulators might see it as problematic. I think there is a lesson to be learned, um, as you can see from another internet-based debate around net neutrality. Uh, net neutrality uh, is the term used for internet networks and the question, should those who use more bandwidth, like streaming services or people using YouTube, actually pay more? Because you use much more um, of the resources than, than others who just send an email. And um, this, as you may know, um, emerged into a, a huge debate on both sides of the Atlantic and actually in regulation at the end, which prohibited this type of paid prioritization. And uh, it's, as I said, very early days for this technology, but given that there is an impact on consumers and SMEs, and given that, as you can see on the right, there are certain industries which are closer to regulation anyway, like banks and stock exchanges, um, I think that is something to consider because uh, it's a problem that someone might take up if there are complaints. At least on the European side, um, we see in the US currently less of a trend to that. And for a real global technology like blockchain, that would obviously then result in further problems if we have local regulation. I conclude to say that um, you will not be surprised as a competition lawyer. I'm not a big fan of regulation. Um, I think that actually we antitrust lawyers and authorities on the other side can deal with these questions uh, much better because it's a targeted approach only if there's really a problem rather than putting regulation out there. So um, this is kind of my advertising for considering antitrust law not only as a challenge. Yes, it can be a challenge if you think around the uh, first part I started with, the information exchange. But there are also chances, chances for newcomers to use antitrust arguments for getting access or chances for everyone in the market to get light touch and targeted, not regulation, but solutions to the problems. Thank you.